Admiral Paparo, Commander, U.S. Pacific Fleet. Aloha, good morning, dear friends. Uh. <laughs> Great to be here in Hawaii, uh, crossroads of continents here in the Central Pacific and a center of innovation uh, for the United States and for the world. And uh, it's especially an honor to be here at FC at TechNet. Uh, our second time together in the last year, uh, a bigger and a richer crowd uh, with numbers of uh, registrants exceeding those before COVID. Uh, with my very great thanks to General Lawrence and to Ms. Linda Newton for their leadership in setting up this conference of, uh, with, with all the intellect that's, uh, that's attending here uh, today. I, wanna, uh, I don't wanna completely repeat the, wor the words we spoke at the last uh, TechNet because I just wanna prime the pump a little bit and I wanna open the floor to questions and comments, which is where, with all the intellect that's collected here in this room, where all the richness and the power of our discussion is. But um, as all are aware and here, uh, coming on the heels of uh, consequential uh, political events worldwide, we're living in incredibly consequential times. A period of intense competition, a period of incredibly high stakes, and we sit right now here in the Central Pacific under the shadow of potential conflict. And if you are within earshot of my voice right now, you must know that you're indispensable in our ability to deter that conflict and if necessary, uh, to fight and win. A generation ago, we were locked in a Cold War. And during that Cold War, we operated under certain paradigms. There was very little interdependency between, between the competitors in the Cold War. And during those times, uh, defense significantly led innovation efforts that ultimately transmitted into the commercial and the industrial world. And the Cold War thinking is a poor analog for the times when we live today, where among the competitors, there are significant interdependencies from a security from an industrial, from an economic standpoint, and the explosion in innovation in information technology has, to some extent, turned the paradigm of defense leading innovation on its head. And today, for, to a very great extent, industry leads that innovation. And it is in that innovation and the creativity that's unlocked within all of the allies and partners who are within earshot of my voice are the keys to prevailing in competition and if necessary, the keys to prevailing in combat. Generations ago, a thinker named John Boyd postulated in his series of lectures, patterns of conflict, the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act and uh, understanding that the combatant that was able to observe, orient, decide, and act would prevail on the battlefield. And today, across the services, through our concept of uh, JADC2, uh, Project Convergence, Project Overmatch, all of the services are, uh, are in unison in their belief of the necessity to bring mass data analytics, to bring, uh, to bring widespread availability of information, to add richness to our ability to see, to understand, to decide, to act, and assess within the battle space that we're operating. From the span standpoint of understanding what our adversaries are doing, from the standpoint of uh, being able to uh, assure our own C2, assure our own ability to see, understand, act in the battle space, transmit orders between units, 
our ability to sustain the force as well. And uh, it is in this enterprise of uh, decision superiority, the ability to assure our own ability to see, understand, decide, act in a piece of battle space, and to frustrate our adversary's ability to see, understand, decide, act. Uh, the, the, the actor that's able to assure their own cycle and, and frustrate their adversary's cycle is in fact who will prevail. If you are within earshot of my voice and you serve in this enterprise and all in the earshot of my voice serve, civilian, service, contractor, I really don't care who you are. You're indispensable to this effort and you're providing service to the nation. You must know that you are key and you are indispensable of our ability to compete in this battle space. And what we're competing for is our international rules-based order based on the principles of human dignity, human freedom, sovereignty, freedom of the seas, freedom of the skies, all of the portfolio of international rules that have lifted 60% of the world out of poverty since the end of the Second World War and lift 160,000 people out of poverty every single day. It is a worthy, worthy undertaking. In fact, our futures and the futures of generations depend on it and depend on these values. And uh, with that, I want to thank each and every one of you for your service. And I would like to open up the floor to any question on any topic whatsoever for discussion. Um, please come what may. Thank you, sir. Uh, the first audience question is, what are the most urgent technology gaps that you see in the fleet? I think the, the most urgent, I mean, uh, the, our most urgent technology gaps are, um, are number one, uh, the ability to counter our adversaries' uh, ability to see and understand the battle space. And those are the technology gaps to dazzle, to deceive, and if necessary, to destroy the sensors and the networks that enable an adversary to understand our own scheme of maneuver from fires and effects, maneuver and sustainment. Uh, that's number one. Uh, and, um, and with every single day, our adversaries are working to get better and we are in a constant cycle of overmatch in our ability to overmatch our adversaries. Our number two gap is that is again our own ability to have widespread common operating picture that enables commanders at every level to be able to see the enemy, to be able to use uh, machine tools to target and pair weapons and effects on enemy units so that in order to place the terms of engagement most advantageous uh, to the allies. And then, um, and then um, long range fires that enable us to, uh, to affect those effects on the battlefield. And then finally, um, and, and, and the, the uh, decision tools that enable us to make calculations that in the past were done by intuition that enable machine tools and enable us to do the operations analysis to be able to pick units and weapons to engage our enemies in such a way that maximizes our effects and maximizes our survival while still maintaining the elements of human accountability which must be a part of warfare for all of us. And that is, you know, finally that ability to have a machine do machine tasks but maintain human accountability over the taking of human lives or the destruction of key critical infrastructure. Um, these are the challenges that are ahead of us. And if you see yourself as being a part of that solution, 
because if you're within earshot of my voice right now, you are. Uh, you're seeing it just right. Uh, and so uh, I, the, the, the most key technological challenges are not kinetic challenges associated with warheads or propellants. The key, techno the key technical challenges are in the form of information technology that enables us to outcycle our enemies' decision cycles um, on the battlefield. Thank you for that question. Thank you, sir. The next question is, with the inroads of China in the Solomon Islands, how do we proceed? And uh, I, 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 appreciate that, I appreciate that very much. First, on the Solomon Islands, um, it, it's, um, it's, quite it's quite ironic that, that uh, Guadalcanal, and uh, when we're talking about the Solomon Islands, we're talking about Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal is on the lips of every sailor and every Marine as, a, as, as such an, a, a sacred and consequential place in American history, a site of so much sacrifice during the, during the Second World War across the South Pacific from Papua New Guinea to Rapa Nui, Easter Island, um, Easter Island in parlance. Um, there, is, there, are, there is a rich history of shared values and shared interests in that space. Um, for, the, for the most part, uh, our adversaries would move into a space in order to exclude the allies. Uh, our approach is a values-based approach, not exclusive in any way, but to engage with the nations of the South Pacific based on our shared history and based on our shared interest and to avoid any of that key geography in the South Pacific that could be used to exclude or to cut off any of the allies or to exclude any of the commerce among those states that supports the same international rules-based order. So how we should proceed is in the form of engagement, an engagement informed by our values. Throughout the South Pacific, there are key security needs. Uh, chief among these are um, Maritime domain awareness to counter IUU fishing and to counter illicit trafficking. All the nations of the South Pacific are deeply dependent on the sea for the sustainment of their populations. And so, uh, and so uh, security assistance and security cooperations in such a way that, uh, that ensures uh, that. And then another key area of cooperation is in the form of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Uh, it's key geography that is vulnerable to tropical cyclones. There are populations that could otherwise be isolated and cut off. And so our readiness to join with the international community, with international government organizations, with non-government organizations to enable humanitarian assistance and disaster relief are key elements for the military instrument along with the rest of the government approach to ensure that we've got steady and consistent engagement in that key geography. Um, uh, to, su to support our engagement there, and not in an exclusive way, but in an inclusive way. And our mode of competition is with our values. Uh, so thank you for that question. Thank you, sir. The next question from the audience, um, can you share recent partnership efforts and advancements with our allies and partners in the region? Well, I'll give a couple of uh, recent ones. Uh, I've, just, uh, I've just returned from uh, Santiago, Chile, and uh, Lima, Peru, and Papayete in, um, in Polynesia uh, with some engagement with some partners there. And, um, and, and so, uh, uh, Peru, Peru, and Chile are Pacific nations with interests in the Pacific. Uh, the interests, uh, particularly for the military instrument, rest on, uh, again, maritime domain awareness to combat illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing 
and uh, as and um, a desire to uh, protect their sea lines of communication, and um, and so uh, and and you know as everybody knows, both Chile and Peru were eager and effective participants in RIMPAC here just in the last uh, in the in the recent past, and uh, and and these are examples. But you know when you say can you share recent partnership and allied activities too. I'd have a much harder time sharing unpartnered and unallied activity because uh, just about every single thing that we do, we do with allies and partners. Uh, there was a recent uh, trilateral ballistic missile defense uh, exercise uh, in the seas between Japan and South Korea uh, with the United States, with South Korea, with Japan. Uh, in the in that in those uh, waters here uh, very recently uh, we're now conducting our uh, combined afloat uh, readiness and training with Brunei uh, among the ASEAN partners and we have activities going on with each of the ASEAN partners um, along the way um, and so I you know I'd have a harder time telling you what we're not doing from a partnered standpoint and uh, it's, a, it's a very exciting time to be in the Pacific right now because of the um, growing, uh, the, the, um, growing trend of uh, partnered activities in, in cases of mutual interest uh, to cooperate afloat. And uh, you know, in, in my heart, I believe navies cooperate best because of the shared heritage and because of the shared risk and because of uh, uh, the international nature of the global commons. And, uh, and so from Lima, Peru, to Chile, to Papeete, to Australia, to the Philippines, to the island of Borneo with Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei, uh, into the Indian Ocean uh, with uh, subject matter exchange exchanges with India, uh, is that really across the entire theater is there is profound uh, partnered operations ongoing um, uh, you know, for, for U.S. Pacific Fleet and for U.S. Indo-PACOM. Thanks for that question. Thank you, sir. Next question from the audience. How is the fleet helping to inform Project Overmatch? Thanks for that question. First of all, just an explication of what Project Overmatch is, and I'll give you a uh, I'll give you a um, a crude example. Although this group is august enough to not need a crude example, but uh, if you were to uh, take a flight uh, and uh, you had your phone in your pocket, and if you were to land in Germany, for instance, uh, upon landing, once you came off of airplane mode. You look on your phone, you get a little searching icon, and then shortly thereafter, you'd get your bars and you'd get your, uh, you know, you'd get your text message that said, we're gonna charge you $10 a day because now you're in Germany and you're using this network and your phone would know. And you'd ask yourself the same question that you do when your thermos knows whether it's gonna be hot or cold. You'd say, how do it know? How, you know, how, how does it know to go get this, to, to do this? And over years and years among our data networks, in the early days, uh, if I was flying an F-18, I had a radar and I had a weapon and my radar and my weapon understood each other, they recognized each other, I'd fire that weapon, I'd send data link messages to that weapon, that weapon would be listening only to me and at the point that it would go active, it would go active and home its way to the target. And um, we, we're no longer in a space where we can do that. We're now in a space where every single sensor must contribute to a fused target pairing based on the covariance of those, of, of the arrival of that target, which helps, helps us understand what it is, where it's going, and its disposition. And so the idea of project overmatch is to be able to use that information as a service so that every platform and every weapon is able to bring as rich a data field as they possibly can to be as accurate and as effective as possible. And so that all units are never tied to a particular scheme of maneuver to support a weapon so that we can always be firing 
from a position of defilade. Uh, that's what project overmatch is uh, at, a, at its essence. So when we say, how is the fleet helping to inform project overmatch, uh, my answer to that is completely, because the fleet is in fact uh, the outcome of a successful project overmatch. And so whether it is in our experimentation and, uh, and we'll shortly be doing another fleet battle problem uh, in the days ahead as, uh, as units make their way here into the Central Pacific, every single day we are conducting experiments with sensors, with platforms, manned and unmanned, and we have a constant uh, drumbeat of uh, sharing information and sharing lessons learned with, uh, with uh, uh, WARCOM, you know, the, the systems command that works, uh, that's uh, the project lead for project, project overmatch. And I'd say also that every single day we're making progress and we're getting smarter towards that goal, that every sensor is contributing to a picture and every platform has got access to the fused data from that, from that essential canopy of sensors, and, uh, and, and we're getting that richer information. And all of that supports uh, the opening discussion, which is the, the, act, the, uh, the, the nation that's able to see, understand, decide, act more accurately and faster is the one that's gonna prevail in the 21st century. Thanks for that question, that's a good one. Thank you, sir. What were the major takeaways from the recent RIMPAC exercise? Well, I'll say the first, to the first takeaway was uh, the solidarity of the 28 nations from almost every inhabited continent on Earth, understanding that uh, the Indo-Pacific is the economic and the security center of gravity on the globe. And it may have been, coming on the heels of COVID, it may have been the largest rim pack ever. Uh, we, uh, we increased our game to put uh, not just part, ta part task training into individual serials, but uh, as commands individually. And, uh, and, and, you know, among those 28 nations, almost everyone had command of a particular operation during that period of time. Uh, we saw great decision making and, uh, and, and we had the opportunity to learn from each other um, all along. And then, um, and so, and then the, the, you know, the last is, is that with every single day, we gain a greater ability uh, to command and to lead at the combined level as we take not only our own challenges that we're trying to overcome among the joint force, but as we're extending to uh, joint and combined command and control by operating on the same networks, on leveling our common operating picture that we're all operating off of, and then, and then acting. And so it was a very inspiring event. Uh, it was from the military standpoint and the, from a viewpoint of operational excellence, it was an inspiring event. And even more so in the spirit of cooperation, the spirit of solidarity among the 28 nations. Um, it, it, you know, it was a sight to behold and I, I can't wait for the next one. Thank you, sir. The next question from the audience is, can you share what specific partnership efforts are being taken with Taiwan? Yes, well, the, the uh, Taiwan Relations Act um, directs the department uh, to assist Taiwan with uh, defensive capabilities such uh, to enable Taiwan to resist any effort to resolve cross-strait differences by force. And then the Taiwan Relations Act um, also directs the Department of Defense to be ready uh, to thwart any effort, uh, any effort to uh, to do so. And and so uh, there is a uh, there is a a rich um, uh, you know a a rich um, 
dialogue of advising and assisting um, to enable Taiwan to, in fact, defend itself to any attempt to resolve those differences by force. And um, they have made uh, really inspiring strides uh, within the nation to become, or no, or within Taiwan to become a more, um, how shall I say it, uh, a more porcupine-like um, capability uh, to impose costs on any aggressor that would uh, resolve those differences by force. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next question is, how are you collaborating with other services in advancing the efforts of the integrated warfighting network? Uh, well, the first I'll say is um, every day is how, we're is how we're collaborating together too. I think um, Indo-PACOM, if I, I'm, I didn't study much Latin, but I believe Indo-PACOM is Latin for operates jointly every day. And uh, so uh, that's the first thing I'll say. And, uh, and so, uh, and, and um, there are a lot of efforts um, ongoing um, right now. Um, and you know, Project Overmatch is a case, Fleet Battle Problem, Valiant Shield uh, are examples. Uh, in, in fact, every single thing that we do, in, in the same manner that I said, everything that we do, I, be, I much have a, much have I have a much harder time at, uh, laying out things that we do unilaterally from a partnered standpoint. It's impossible for me to, uh, it's impossible for me to, uh, uh, to state anything that we don't do uh, jointly. And so uh, we participate richly in each other's warfighting exercises whether it's a fleet battle problem being uh, conducted by United States Pacific Fleet, whether it is uh, Project Convergence 22, uh, which took place off the west coast of the mainland uh, here recently, um, army-led but with rich participation from across, from across the services. But uh, in fact, JADC2, whether you're talking about uh, the Navy's Project Overmatch, the Army's Project Convergence, IBMS, uh, no matter what program that we're talking about, um, we're all coming together understanding the urgency of our ability to operate on common networks and to achieve the effects of bringing the richness of all of our systems together for, sh for shared situational awareness. And, uh, and also to, um, to employ those ops analysis tools that enable us to have machines make dis decisions that make recommendations that machines can make while maintaining human accountability over, that, over those decisions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next audience question, how is off the shelf public or commercial technology impacting US and adversary capabilities to create disruption effects faster and cheaper? Well, um, I hope and pray that US off the shelf public and commercial technology is not impacting our adversaries. And, uh, and you know, I have great trust in uh, our uh, security capabilities uh, to ensure that. And I have great trust in the US government in our ability to protect that key intellectual uh, property. Uh, and and uh, it was a point that I touched on when we first began speaking is that um, I'm seeing much greater innovation and much greater um, application of commercial off-the-shelf technology for our usage um, then I've seen it going the other way from defense into the commercial world in the past. And I'm making eye contact with several in this room. Uh, there are gaming applications that were first innovated for gaming purposes that have direct applications to our own ability to do gaming experiment, experimentation, modeling, and simulation. Uh, there are key innovations in the form of precision navigation and timing. Uh, that are also having applications into what we do in the security realm. And, uh, and, and it's a really, uh, really exciting time 
uh, to bring that technology to bear in what we're doing in exactly this way, which is faster and cheaper. And there is a growing consensus within the department itself that some of our older and hidebound means by which we acquire capability are extending risk on the service. And the, the, the notion of reforming the defense ecosystem to the point that the defense sector can innovate at the same rate that the uh, commercial sector is innovating is an idea that's taking hold and we're seeing active progress on. Thank you, sir. One more. Uh, we have several more from the audience, sorry. Next question. Uh, what are some technologies or capabilities or partnerships needed to move the needle on our deterrence posture in the Pacific? Well, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I really kind of uh, explained that here a little bit earlier, but uh, you know, I would like, I would like mass data analytics to understand what the effect of our deterrence activity are on our competitors' calculus. I'd like to know if it's moving the needle. And the way we know that is by what you see in open source, by the behaviors, and uh, at times high-level intel. But uh, that ability to understand um, it, our own act so that it's just not activity that we're conducting. And, and, and I'll, I'll start with just kind of a definition of deterrence, which is uh, that is uh, an actor has got the capability and the will to impose costs greater than are tolerable to your adversary, and your adversary knows it. I know we have the capability. I know that under certain circumstances, uh, the executive branch will have the will. Uh, what I don't know is, is that how is the adversary perceiving our activities in such a way that demonstrates that we seek to uphold the status quo, that, uh, that understands that uh, the differences among nations are not to be resolved by force, and that the allies will move swiftly and quickly to impose costs in response to aggression that would change the status quo with the use of force. So uh, mass data analytics that would, uh, that would take us out of the intuition, uh, in, out of the intuition phase and into a deeper and richer knowledge based on the fusion of what we see in open source and what we see in terms of behaviors. And, and, um, and so uh, I think I think that's the, the biggest technology challenge that I'd like to tackle, um, particularly with regard to the august group that's assembled here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have time for two more questions. Do you have any efficient means for geeks and nerds of small innovative businesses to break through the bureaucratic procurement process and support this important mission for national and global security? Uh, uh, first, uh, um, first um, for, from the questioner too, I would love to know what the difference is between a geek and a nerd. <laughs> That's one. And, uh, and two, we need uh, so-called um, geeks and nerds in order to, in order to break through. And and uh, I, I think that is a I think that I think that it very pithily explains a a serious risk to our ability to fight and win. And I talked about our hidebound acquisition processes that were designed for uh, platforms that weighed several thousand tons that were very dangerous. Uh, and so our, our acquisition processes reflect a means for um, very, you know, very big, very consequential capabilities, usually made of metal and, 
and uh, in the in the form of information technology is uh, Moore's law being what it is, we've got to operate much much faster. Um, the the department the Department of Defense is fully cognizant of that and uh, is really working on experimentation for uh, for these key capabilities and then scaling those key capabilities as we as we move forward. And uh, we're in a constant state of reform. The National Defense Strategy uh, has as one of its as one of its key priorities to uh, to uh, um, pres to uh, reform and to improve the defense ecosystem, and this is a huge this is a huge part of it too. And uh, on the topic of um, geeks and nerds, I hope to be one. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll just say that with eminent respect is that uh, if you are a um, if you are within earshot of my voice and you color yourself as a geek and nerd. If you would send me an application and start inviting me to the meetings, I would be really appreciative. Thank you, sir. This is our final question. Where can industry focus on mitigating potential gaps and seams from seabed to space on your greatest needs? I think, um, I think mass data analytics. Uh, I think uh, ops analysis tools. Uh, that uh, do that employ uh, multiple quantitative techniques that enable us to dig, to get machine to get uh, machine calculations to support human decision making uh, anything that fuses multiple sensors in Rosetta stones that eliminates barriers between stove piped uh, data systems uh, with different data standards that uh, enable a uh, real-time picture of the battle space with high target quality level uh, location of key targets with the identification of those targets and with, uh, with uh, systems that enable us to understand the joint and allied picture to be able to most efficiently achieve fires and effects on those targets that enable us to efficiently and effectively sustain the force in a highly complex environment and that will free us from our primitive heuristic means by which we make decisions in order to be more thoughtful about how we conduct uh, our operations to deter and to prevail. But, uh, but uh, in, in my own, in my own um, estimation, uh, information technology decision advantage is the so-called third offset. And it is in the ability to see and understand the battle space and the ability to, uh, to most efficient, efficiently, effectively, lethally, and survivably uh, achieve fires and effects on key targets so that we can prevail with as little loss of life on the, on the joint and allied force and for that matter gain the early leverage on our operations uh, to avoid finding ourselves in cycles of attrition warfare which uh, given our values is not our goal. Yes, Linda New So, mahalo, Admiral Paparo, for your time and your remarks today. You talked about the need to see, understand, decide, act, assess, to prevail. We need to counter enemy ability to engage in the battle space. We need a widespread COP at all levels for knowledge, action, and effects, decision tools to maximize effects and survivability, and also to maintain human accountability. That's the first time I've heard people talk about that um, as, we, as we put those decision tools together. So I think that that's something to, 
to uh, make note of. And the last one, you talked about data analytics to move from intuition to knowledge. So with that, we'd like, on behalf of FCA International and FCA Hawaii, we are providing a donation to the Friends of Windward Wounded Warriors for all our speakers this week. We would also like to present you with the coveted challenge coin highlighting the 37th TechNet Indo-Pacific. And then I ask that you all remain in your seats until our MC has finished his remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Adam Paparo, for the most uh, informative presentation I've heard so far. <laughs> All right, so just a few, just a few remarks before we depart. Uh, the panel at, at 0945, the panel title, What is Needed to Ensure Zero Trust at the Operational Warfighting Environments, will be held at the South Pacific Ballroom uh, 2, um, Ballroom 2, 3, and 4. At 1230, uh, Brigade General um, James Bartholomew's U.S. Pacific, U.S. Army Pacific G G3 will be our keynote presentation. Uh, tickets to this evening Pal Hana event is is tonight, and is supported by Sienna and Lumen, and is still available to purchase at the registration desk. Please visit the uh, innovation showcase located upstairs in the South Pacific Ballroom One, and meet tomorrow's leaders in future technology and program. And also, please refer to the FC TechNet. Indo-Pacific uh, app and uh, download it on Google, uh, on Google Play, uh, on iTunes, et cetera, for the rest of today's uh, events. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attending. This concludes our morning breakfast event.